as Ian said, I'm an emergency medicine consultant in the south of England. You may be wondering, why is an emergency medicine consultant talking to you about dermatology? Well, the reason, the reason I've chosen this uh, topic is that actually it's incredibly clinically relevant. Um, sometimes it's hard to see when you're a medical student you know, how all this theory comes into practice. Um, and actually skin problems are one of my favorite things to see in the emergency department. And what we're gonna go through today is um, basically some, some infective conditions and conditions that you might see presenting to the emergency department in the future and try and tie that in a little bit with some of the theory that you may have covered uh, in your preclinical years at medical school. So, just in case you haven't joined Bite Medicine and signed up to the app fully, um, just wanted to highlight that you can take advantage of all the SBAs and the textbook uh, pages that we've got on there. Um, really useful, even later on in your career. You know, I have to say that I really enjoy going through some of the questions as well. So if you haven't had a look at the website, then please do take a good look through. Um, there are extra SBAs covering uh, some of the skin conditions that we talk about today on there the textbook as well, lots of conditions covered, and particularly for some of the skin conditions we're talking about today, there's some extra detail that you can find on there. I've tried not to repeat too much of the information, um, try to add in some different perspectives, and we'll talk about some more clinical aspects as well. Um, some of my experience in the emergency department, uh, you know, seeing the, and treating these conditions, but you can get a bit more background if you have a look on the textbook on our website as well. So what we're going to cover today is skin structure, the relevance of that to skin infections, the clinical features of several types of skin infection, the risk factors and investigation and management of those. Sign up to menti.com, the code is there uh, for some questions and we're actually going to be going straight into a question to start with. Um, so if you do all want to go over to menti and pop that code in, So as a starter, we've got a question um, that hopefully you'll remember from your preclinical years. So we're looking at which of the following skin layers is only identifiable on samples from the palmar surfaces of the hands and the plantar surfaces of the feet. So the options are stratum granulosum, stratum corneum, stratum lucidum, stratum basale, and stratum spinosum. I'm just going to go over to the Menti page. Hide this. Okay. Excellent. So lots of responses. Bit of a bit of a spread with what we've got there. Okay, I'll just give it a minute. We've still got a few more people answering. Okay, it looks like all the answers are in, and we've got a bit of a tie here. So the correct answer is actually the stratum lucidum. So we'll just go back to the presentation. So if we have a little look at the skin structure here. So I've got the thick hairless skin, which is found in, on the palms and on the plantar surfaces of the feet on the left there. And stratum lucidum is this extra layer uh, that you find just in those areas. Um, we've then got the other four layers that you can see on the right side with the, the thin skin, stratum corneum, stratum granulosum, stratum spinosum, and stratum basale. So the stratum lucidum just gives you that thicker uh, texture that you've got uh, on the palms of the hands and the plant surfaces of the feet. It is a favorite question um, in SBAs and exams. 
you know, it's got the right number of options um, you know, to, to put in an SBA. Um, so it's, it's worth remembering this one for your exams um, as it's a, it's a very common one. I remember having it during my medical school exams. And so it's always worth remembering. Looking at the skin structure here, we will bring this diagram back later, but I just want you to have a think about you know, the, where the blood vessels are, where the lymphatics are, um, the different layers as we come down. And what we're going to do is work through these layers with respect to infections that can occur. So at the very, at the very surface, we've got impetigo. So this is a superficial bacterial infection of the epidermis. Very commonly affects children, but can affect adults as well, particularly those with young children. The clinical features are there's a bullous and a non-bullous form. So the non-bullous form, uh, you get pink macules that evolve into pustules, and then you get these very classical golden crusted erosions that you can see in the picture there. The bullous form, vesicles develop and evolve into larger bully. Um, and this, this, this form can look a bit more alarming. Certainly this is something that patients might come to the emergency department with, you know, sort of worried that they've got severe infections, they see blisters, um, and they can be really quite alarmed by the appearance of this. Um, it might, you might not always see the golden crust straight away, often can form, but the bully can be very alarming to patients. Um, systemic features are usually absent because this is uh, an infection of the epidermis, so the very top layer of the skin. The infection isn't spreading downwards, so you're not getting to the layers where there's lots of blood vessels, and you're not getting that spread um, in the same way that you can with it, deeper infections. Um, you know, it is very much on the surface of the skin. So there are two pathogens that are commonly implicated in this, Staphylococcus aureus and Streptococcus pyogenes. And we'll talk a little bit about those slightly further on. Risk factors are young age, close contact with infected people. So this classically occurs in children who are at nursery. They started mixing with other children. They're often touching each other's faces, hands. Um, you know, they sort of, they, they rub against each other. They're not, there's not a lot of hand washing or well, certainly pre-COVID. Um, you know, there was less of a focus on that with the children at nursery. And so this can spread very, very easily. Coexisting skin conditions where there are skin breaks uh, can increase the risk somewhat, but you don't have to have a skin break uh, to, to get in vitigo. Um, you know, contact um, with intact skin, the infection can still spread, which is part of the reason that it is just so contagious and that you can see large outbreaks of it in schools and nurseries. Investigations aren't usually required. Um, it's a clinical diagnosis. So looking at the location, it's often on hands, face. Uh, it's got that classic golden crusted appearance. And you're looking at the sort of the age group. So young children, toddlers or their carers. And so you don't normally need to undertake any investigations unless you've got a case that doesn't have a typical clinical appearance or isn't responding to the initial treatment being given. So for non-bullous impetigo, a topical antiseptic such as hydrogen peroxide can be used. For bullous impetigo, or someone who's systemically unwell, suggesting that perhaps the infection is spreading deeper, you can start an oral antibiotic such as flucloxacillin or clarithromycin in penicillin allergic patients. It's really important uh, to think about um, you know, the topical uh, antibiotics. Uh, in your exam situation, it may be presented as an option and you should make sure you know what your local recommendations are country by country. In the UK, NICE guidelines do suggest that topical antibiotics such as fusidin can be used, um, but other countries such as New Zealand actually advise against this because of the possibility of developing uh, antibiotic resistance. So for your exams, please do check your local guidelines regarding this. You, are, you would be fairly safe to choose an oral antibiotic 
um, as an option. If you were if you were given options. Um, for a bullet in Patigo treatment, it would be entirely reasonable to select oral antibiotic as a treatment. Um, you know, if there is an alternative um, you know, of topical antibiotic, just think about your local country guidelines for that. So we're going to go into another question now. So a 19 year old woman has presented with multiple vesicles and bullet on her right hand, wrist and face. Her three year old son has been at home for the last few days after catching in Patigo at nursery. She's systemically well, very slightly tachycardic, heart rate 94, blood pressure 130 over 76, a respiratory rate of 18, saturation is 98% on air and a temperature of 37.6. So the question is, this is going to be a two stage question, which of the following proteins is being damaged by the causative organism in this case? So you need to think about what is the causative organism and then think about which protein is being damaged by that. And a lot of SBAs that you get will be this two step. You've got to make the deduction first and then answer the question, depending on what the deduction that you've made for the first part of the question. So we'll switch over to Menti. Go to the next question. And I'll give you all a moment to, to put your answers in. Just to give everybody a few more moments to get their answers in. Okay, so the correct answer is Desmoglein 1. So desmoglein 1 is a component of the desmosomes. It's targeted by exfoliative toxins released by Staphylococcus aureus. So the deduction to make in this question was that this was bullous impetigo. And bullous impetigo is almost always caused by Staphylococcus aureus. Stre uh, strep pyogenes um, is responsible for a lot of impetigo cases, the non-bullous form, but the bullous form is almost always Staphylococcus aureus. So Staphylococcus aureus uh, produces a number of exfoliative toxins. Um, I think there's an A to E that I know about at the moment, but obviously people are always looking for more. Um, and so I would double check the, the, the numbers, the letters that there are now. Um, but these to toxins, uh, they target desmoglein 1. Desmoglein 3 is a target of autoantibodies in the mucosal dominant form of Pemphigus vulgaris. Laminin 5 is one of the proteins affected in junctional epidermolysis bullosa. So this is another blistering skin condition. Dystonin, um, was which was previously known as BP230, has multiple isoforms targeted by autoantibodies in bullous pemphigoid. And collagen 7 is the protein affected in dystrophic um, epidermolysis bullosa. Um, this is a protein that's involved in binding the dermis to the epidermis. And so you have problems with it, you get this lifting, this blistering of the skin. So all the conditions on here, it's worth having a look at them as these are favorites in exam questions. It's very easy um, when you're rapidly going through questions and exam to get yourself confused with the different forms of pemphigus, pemphigoid, the different types of epidermolysis bullosa. 
And these are, you, you may never come across epididymolysis bullosa ever again in your career, but it will come up a lot in your final medical exam questions. So these sorts of, these proteins, um, these diseases are really high yield uh, for your medical exam questions. And they may be covered in one of our other dermatology lectures. Um, I think that the uh, SBAs run by Richard a few, couple of days ago did cover some of these conditions, but it's really worth going through them um, to help you know, with, with some of those trickier exam questions that come up, because it is very easy to just read pemphigus, pemphigoid quickly, um, and then suddenly find yourself going for the wrong answer. So this is just a diagram showing where these toxins um, damage the, the desmoglein 1. So desmoglein 1 is found through, throughout the skin layers, but predominantly in the stratum granulosum. So this is where there's the, the highest expression of this protein. Um, by damaging this, you, can, you then get a lifting of the layers above, which gives you these vesicles and these bullae. And as you can see from the, from the reference to our previous diagram, this really is the very top layers of the skin. So this is all very superficial infection that we're talking about here. So we're going to move down a layer now and look at erysipelas. So erysipelas is often mixed in with cellulitis. Clinically, it can actually be very difficult to differentiate between the two. Um, but sometimes you are able to, and you may, you may see cases where you're actually able to, to differentiate between the conditions and say that this is erysipelas rather than cellulitis. So erysipelas is a bacterial infection of the upper dermis, extending to the superficial lymphatics. And there'll be a diagram in a couple of pages where you can see that. And what this does is it gives you a very well demarcated raised erythematous rash. And it is better demarcated than a cellulitic rash, um, which affects deeper layers, and so is less distinct. Um, so working through the layers, it's always impetigo is very clear. It's, it's the layer at the top. We can see that really well. The erysipelas, it's still pretty high up in the skin layers. So the effect of infection there, you get quite a sharp demarcated line. The, path the pathogen is typically Streptococcus pyogenes. Something to be aware of uh, clinically and for exam questions is erysipelothrix in erysipeloid. So I've highlighted it there as this is another one of those, those words in dermatology where skimming over it in an exam question, it's very easy to get confused between the two. Um, and again, this is something that might come up in, in medical finals, just as one of those slightly trickier questions. Um, and it's always useful to be aware of. Um, so this condition, um, erysipeloid, presents in patients who have contact with animals. So it's handling fish, you know, vets, farmers. Um, so having contact with the reservoirs that carry this bacteria, so it's animal reservoirs, fish reservoirs. Um, you then get inoculation typically to the hands. So this, this is something that's often seen on the hands. And you get a rash that's very similar to the appearance of erysipelas. It's well demarcated, um, but the location and the history are, are what give you the diagnosis. So it's, you know, it's looking at the job of the person that's come in, looking at the site of inoculation. Fortunately, treatment is pretty much the same. The antibiotics that will cover um, uh, streptococcus pyogenes will also cover for erysipelothrix. Um, so treatment-wise, you don't need to worry too much about distinguishing between the two, um, but certainly for your exams, it's worth remembering. So risk factors for erysipelas, skin breaks, so pre-existing skin conditions, eczema, psoriasis, immunocompromise, and that includes things like type 2 diabetes, and previous episodes of erysipelas. So because you've got an infection that's uh, extending to the superficial lymphatics, you can get damaged those lymphatics in the infection. And once they've been damaged and the drainage to the, to the skin is impaired, you're then at a higher risk of further infection. So you may come across patients who have recurrent episodes 
And sometimes people actually get thrown by this. They think that because the patient is getting infection after infection, that there must be an alternative diagnosis that they can't possibly have had erythropolis you know, several times in a row you know, on the face. And they think it may potentially be another diagnosis. But it's worth being aware that people do get recurrent episodes of this, often to the point that they may end up on uh, long-term antibiotics as a preventative for this after the lymphatics have been damaged by that original episode. In terms of investigations, particularly if you're not able to clinically differentiate it from cellulitis, you're worried about the extent of the infection, we're going to start doing the typical more invasive tests that we do, so um, looking at a full blood count, CRP, you'd expect to see a raised white cell count, leukocytosis, um, a raised CRP. Blood cultures, the patient's pyrexial, systemically unwell at all. And treatment, depending on how unwell the patient is, the patient's uh, comorbidities, social situation, um, think about oral intravenous antibiotics. Many patients can be managed on oral antibiotics. This is a condition that might be managed well in GP, never having to come to secondary care. Um, but the, you know, the antibiotic choices are usually similar to those for cellulitis. So checking the local cellulitis pathway um, for sensitivities in your area. Generally, flucloxacillin is going to be a safe choice. Clarithromycin in penicillin allergic patients. So you can see from the diagram here, yeah, we've moved down from, from the epidermis, and we're now looking at the dermis. And as you can see with the lymphatics, so the, the, the green structures there are the lymphatics. Yeah, this is an infection that's affecting those. Um, and that then gives you the, the risks of the recurrent infections there once you've damaged those lymphatics. And it gives you, that's what gives you this raised appearance of the skin. So the drainage is impaired um, by the infection and inflammation surrounding these, these lymphatics. And you start to get this raised looking edematous area of skin. So cellulitis is a bacterial infection of the lower dermis and subcutaneous tissue. So it may appear less distinct um, you still get erythematous, swollen, painful skin, but the edge um, may be less distinct that it is an erythropolis. But as I mentioned, in clinical practice, it's sometimes very difficult to differentiate between the two. And it doesn't actually change management significantly. So once you're getting into the, these deeper tissues, there's a risk of more systemic symptoms. Lymphangitis might, may be present, so now that we're in an area that's surrounding the lymphatics, that infection can then spread. And you may see a tracking line following the, um, the lymphatics up the arm um, or up the leg. And so that's this line that you may see. So for example, someone with hand or forearm cellulitis, you may be able to see a, a line going heading up towards the axilla. Um, you can see that infection spreading. And it's important to mark that and have a look at the rapidity of the spread that you're getting there. So there's a number of pathogens that can be responsible for cellulitis. Um, common ones, Streptococcus pyogenes, Staphylococcus aureus. You can get Pseudomonas as well. Um, in children, um, and if you start looking at uh, facial cellulitis, Haemophilus influenzae is a um, a, cause, a causative pathogen, but there's many, many others, but the two commonest ones are at the top there. So risk factors, again, it's, it's pre-existing trauma to skin. So ulcers, psoriasis, eczema, um, injuries to the skin, so gardening injuries. We have lots of people coming into the emergency department who scratch themselves in the garden, um, you know, caught themselves on a wire, um, all these things are risk factors for cellulitis, anything that's breaching the skin. Immunosuppression, um, particularly diabetes, um, the risk when you've got sort of peripheral neuropathy, people might not notice injuries that they've got on their legs, um, which then makes it higher risk. You don't see the injury, you don't protect that skin because you, you don't know that there's been an injury there. 
the risk of EAs then getting, getting it contaminated, that wound contaminated is higher, and patients may not notice the pain initially from the infection that they have. The higher blood sugar promotes bacterial growth. So there's lots of reasons why diabetic patients are at higher risk of developing cellulitis that is then more rapidly spreading. Venous disease as well, um, you, know, you will typically see cellulitis affecting the leg. Um, it's the commonest presentation of it that we see. Um, and you know, in your practice, whether you go to be, whether you end up as GPs or whether you end up in the emergency department, you will see lots and lots of patients um, with venous disease, with cellulitis. Always think about differentiating between chronic skin changes and cellulitis though. Be aware that bilateral cellulitis is extremely rare. If you do come across a patient that's documented as having bilateral cellulitis, go and look carefully. It's far more likely that they've got chronic venous disease of the skin. It puts them at risk of cellulitis, um, but developing bilateral cellulitis is extremely unusual. Um, so it's one of the, the diagnoses that get quite commonly sort of reversed on the medical ward round. Um, you know, have a careful think about the pre-existing skin disease that might be there. Um, and look for other infections if that's the case, because you may just have chronic venous skin disease on, on the legs. You know, don't miss another infection elsewhere uh, being distracted by that. So for cellulitis, as I mentioned before, yeah, we're trying to categorize how unwell these patients are. So we're looking at the full blood count, renal function, CRP. You may go on to do some further tests that we'll talk about in the next section, just to help you differentiate the severity of this disease and help you decide whether this patient can go home on oral antibiotics or whether they need to come into hospital. If they're pyorexial, do blood cultures. It may help you isolate the organism. And particularly if it turns out to be an unusual or resistant organism, it's going to inform your antibiotic choice. Swab for culture and sensitivities under certain circumstances. So some patients may not have obvious skin breaks um, or any discharge from the area. Um, NICE guidance actually gives uh, some very good guidelines about when we should be swabbing. And it is those patients at higher risk of more unusual infections. So patients who've had foreign travel Patients who work with animals you know, in, in farming, agricultural in, industries, and have had injuries from those, they are at higher risk of more unusual infections. And it's then thinking about patients who aren't responding to initial treatment as well. So management is typically flucloxacillin, clarithromycin, in pregnancy, erythromycin. Obviously looking at your local guidelines with facial involvement, um, coamoxetile or clarithromycin. The reason I put a star there is that this often needs specialist or senior input. Uh, facial cellulitis can be an extremely serious disease with multiple complications that can ex extend intracranially. So if they occur in the danger triangle, the central zone of the face. Um, so it's really important um, to take this seriously. And the default should be that the patient needs intravenous antibiotics and that you're then risk assessing them to see whether you can give them orals. But facial cellulitis can be an extremely serious condition. So that's why I've just highlighted that there. So if a patient has a severe infection, they need to be admitted for IV antibiotics. Um, Keftraxone is often used in many ambulatory settings, so medical and emergency ambulatory um, settings. Um, we can often give a once daily dose of keftraxone. The patient will come back every day for, for five days to have their intravenous antibiotic once a day and to be reviewed to see how things are progressing. This is extremely useful in freeing up hospital beds making sure the patient is in their own environment, which certainly with the recent pandemic is often a safer place to be uh, than hospital where you risk further hospital acquired infections. Um, it allows patients to remain ambulatory and actually keep them moving and reduce the risk of uh, venous thromboembolism. So ambulatory pathways are actually really useful for cellulitis, but it's really important to risk assess you know, whether the patients are suitable for them. There is absolutely no point trying to send a 92-year-old who lives alone 
um, in a remote area, doesn't have their own transport, you know, has, struggle, has, has difficulty mobilising, they are not the patients who are going to be suitable for, for ambulatory cellulitis management and they are going to need admission to hospital. If MRSA is suspected, add vancomycin or ticoplanin, taking the advice of your, of your local microbiologist. Now, in terms of working out the severity and trying to decide which patients should be admitted and which patients might be suitable for ambulatory pathways, um, there is a classification system that you can look at. Now, there are further details of this uh, on the uh, cellulitis textbook section on the website. So I'm not going to go through this in full now, um, but it's definitely worth having a look at and familiarising yourself with any local pathways that you've got in, your, in the hospitals that you're based in. From a clinical perspective, I'd really like to say don't forget tetanus status. It often, it's often not covered in exams. You'll be thinking about first line treatments, antibiotics, these sorts of things. But in practice, especially these patients that you've got, a, you've got coming in who've been injured in the garden, they might have puncture wounds on the lower limbs that are potentially dirty. Always, always check their tetanus status. Most younger adults in the UK would have had a full course of, of tetanus when they were younger. But patients who have moved from abroad and older patients may not have had their full primary course of tetanus. It's really, really important to check this because it affects um, what you give them in terms of boosters, giving them immunoglobulin. But you know, any injury, skin breaks that you're seeing, GP, the emergency department, just always remember to check tetanus status. Although it's rare, um, you know, we do see cases. Um, you know, cases do occur in the UK um, and it's, you know, it gets missed. It's something that's very, very easy to overlook. So I just wanted to highlight that here for clinical practice. And something else that makes a real difference um, to patients' pain um, is elevation of the limb. You know, this can be painful. You get toxin release from the bacteria, you get edema, you get swelling, and that's painful, it hurts. Um, you know, that swelling is very uncomfortable and you know, that sort of pressure feeling isn't always well relieved by analgesia. And one of the most useful things that you can do to then help the drainage as well, help the blood supply, is to keep the limb elevated. And you're looking to get it to the level of the heart you don't want it. You don't want it up ridiculously high, but try and get it at the level of the heart. So for the lower limbs, you know, a lot of people will put their put their leg on a tiny little footstool that is still you know, below the level of everything else. So it's always important to explain to people, especially if they're going home, they're being ambulated with their cellulitis, to explain the level to elevate the limb at. Um, with upper limb cellulitis. Um, having the arm in a sling on the, on the ward can make a huge difference to the pain and the swelling and the speed of resolution. Um, and it's probably the main change that we make when we admit people uh, with upper limb cellulitis is actually elevating it properly. That's the, we're still giving the same antibiotic a lot of the time, um, but it's that elevation can really help things and especially the symptoms of this, this pressure discomfort. Um, it makes a huge difference to, to how the patient feels. So the diagram again is just highlighting where this infection is occurring. So you can see it's in the lower dermis and subcutaneous tissue. And you can start to see why the edges of that erythema appear more indistinct uh, when, you're, when you're looking at the skin. So there isn't that clear cut edge that you get in the erysipelas because the infection is further down. So that more diffuse erythema without the clear edge um, yeah, is, is more typical of cellulitis you'll still be able to, to mark it. And it's really important that you do mark uh, the edge of cellulitis to check the speed of spread, but it will have a less distinct line than erysipelas because it is further down in the tissue. So we're gonna go on to another question. So a five-year-old girl has been unwell with chicken pox for the last week. Today, she's developed severe pain in her left leg and started vomiting. There's no history of trauma. She looks unwell with slightly cool peripheries. There are scattered typical varicella lesions 
and a very faint patch of erythema on the lateral aspect of the left lower leg. Her observations are heart rate 152, respiratory rate 40, saturation of 96% on air, and temperature of 39.6. So if you're not particularly familiar with paediatrics, um, in terms of heart rate, that is a very high heart rate for a five-year-old. Um, the respiratory rate as well, we're getting into the sort of the much higher pew scoring here. So this is an unwell child. So the question is, which of the following organisms is most likely to be responsible for the patient's current presentation? So again, we're looking at that two-step question. Um, is thinking about which organism, um, what the condition is, what's going on here, and which organism is then responsible for it. So we'll switch over to Menti. And I'll give you a moment to uh, select your answers. So the options are Staphylococcus aureus, Streptococcus pyogenes, Fusobacterium necrophorum, Aeromonas hydrophila, and Haemophilus influenzae type B. Give you a couple more moments just to just to get a, a few more answers in. Looks like we've got a bit of a bit of a split here, but one answer is predominating at the moment. Okay, so the correct answer is Streptococcus pyogenes. So Staphylococcus aureus, popular answer there and often a safe answer. So yeah, these, these top two answers are pretty safe go-tos um, for a lot of dermatological infections. They're going to be responsible for a lot of them, but we'll talk through um, you know, why the correct answer is Streptococcus pyogenes. So Staphylococcus aureus may be responsible in conjunction with Streptococcus pyogenes so the diagnosis for this child is necrotizing fasciitis. So the clues that we've got uh, that in Baricella, um, a, a children, um, basically sort of the, one of the commonest causes in children of necrotizing fasciitis is a post varicella infection of Streptococcus pyogenes. So Staphylococcus aureus can be responsible for necrotizing fasciitis um, in conjunction with uh, strep pyogenes in these cases, but it, typically a monomicrobial infection of streptococcal pyogenes. So it's responsible for about 20 to 30 percent of necrotizing fasciitis infections in the UK and is the commonest cause of necrotizing fasciitis following varicella. So it is the form of necrotizing fasciitis that is most common in children. Fusobacterium necrophorum is just a bacteria that I find quite interesting and I quite like. It's responsible for a very rare condition called Lemierre syndrome, where you get infective thromboses of, of blood vessels. Um, really interesting condition, um, and perhaps on another another uh, discussion we'll we'll talk through it um, because it's a it's a really interesting disease. Um, and the presentations of it are sort of a, a really interesting. I've, had, I've seen a very a fascinating case of it previously, um, but it's you know, it's not relevant in this in this condition. Often seen after um, tonsillitis infections, so head and neck infections, um, where you, you can then get um, infected thrombosis in the vessels, but not relevant to this case. Aeromonas hydrophila is a very rare cause of type three necrotizing fasciitis, which is gram negative monomicrobial necrotizing fasciitis, often seen in, um, again, it's sort of fisheries workers, it's where there's been water exposure for a wound. Um, it's 
has quite a high fatality rate, um, but it is very rare. Um, so in this case, necrotizing fasciitis in a child, um, you know, it's, it's not the correct answer, um, but it's worth bearing in mind um, depending on the history given. Haemophilus influenzae type B can cause secondary respiratory infections in varicella, which is you know, very, very common. I, you know, a few people did pick this. Um, and certainly if you were thinking about a pneumonia um, after chickenpox, you, absolutely, this could be a bacterial, um, a secondary bacterial infection in that. Um, it's also a cause of orbital cellulitis in children, but it's not a typical cause of necrotizing fasciitis. So, Clinical features, the one I put at the top is severe pain, which may be out of proportion to visible signs of infection. And it's, this, is the, this is the clinical feature which may help you save somebody and their limb. So by the time that you've got vis more visible signs and the patient is unwell, you may be too late to salvage their limb and potentially even their life. Yeah, this is the discriminating factor that allows you to make an early diagnosis and it should start you thinking about, is this necrotizing fasciitis rather than cellulitis? So yeah, but when we're talking about sort of severe pain, you know, these patients will be in agony. Um, yeah, they, they may be complaining of severe leg pain and you might not be able to see very much at all. So in our clinical case, there was a slight patch of erythema and that might be all that you can see to start with, you know, a very faint patch. It might e you might even think that you know, the child sat with, say, their legs crossed, um, you know, sort of all, all the person's had their legs crossed while they've been in the car. You know, a very supple patch of erythema. Um, you know, things may then progress rapidly, but the thing that's going to you know, start you thinking about this early on is the severe pain. These are patients that are you know, often requiring intravenous morphine and often large amounts of intravenous morphine. So if, you're, if you've got a patient who 10 milligrams of IV morphine isn't helping their pain, you start thinking about necrotizing fasciitis. The limb may be edematous. The patient may rapidly become systemically unwell. They may, they may have had, been feverish. As the disease progresses, you start to get dusky patches of skin with fluid filled blisters. So those layers of the skin, you're starting to get spread of the infection in all directions. You're compromising the blood supply, the lymphatic drainage. And so the skin becomes dusky. It starts to die, essentially. Um, the increased pressure, the increased edema is compromising the blood supply. You may end up with a compartment syndrome of the limb. Um, and that contributes to this severe pain that the patient has. As the disease progresses, they may become profoundly hypotensive, um, requiring inotropic support, uh, intensive care, um, and you may, may have a toxic shock syndrome. So there's different types of necrotizing fasciitis. It can be categorized by the pathogens present. This is fairly sort of academic. Um, you know, if you think if you think this is necrotizing fasciitis, you're going to be giving broad spectrum antibiotics, you're going to be getting a surgical opinion quickly. So essentially type one is the most commonly seen in the UK. So this is a polymicrobial infection. And this is seen in your more typical patients, the elderly, frail diabetics, poor skin condition on the lower limbs. Um, yeah, this is, the, this is the, the typical and the commonest form that you see. Type two is the type that we had in the case just discussed. So monomicrobial infection with streptococcus pyogenes. Type three, we mentioned um, in, the, in the question. Um, so this very rare monomicrobial gram negative uh, form often comes from marine organisms. And then type four is fungal infections, which are very, very rare. Um, there are some forms of orbital cellulitis, so mucomycosis, um, which give you a necrotizing fasciitis picture, but these are extremely unusual. 80% you know, will be this polymicrobial form and about 20% will be the monomicrobial type two. So as we mentioned, um, the risk factors are skin breaks. 
accidental, but don't forget surgical. So I have seen a case of a post-operative patient um, who'd had a very minor procedure um, at home the same day, who presented the next day with severe pain, had taken all the analgesia that they possibly could before coming to hospital, um, but was still in absolutely agonizing pain. There was very little to see. Uh, looking at the wound, it was a clean, clean looking surgical wound. There was no erythema around it. There was no discharge, but the patient was in absolute agony. Things like compartment syndrome were thought of. So compartment syndrome is always important to think of. You sort of post-operatively, post-fractures as something that can give severe pain. And actually there were delays in the diagnosis, partly because there was nothing obvious to see on the surface of the skin. 48 hours later, the patient was dead. Um, this was a young patient who'd had a minor surgical procedure, um, but unfortunately the necrotizing fasciitis wasn't spotted or treated early enough and the infection had spread through the entire limb by the time that they'd got to theater and they became unstable in theater um, and unfortunately died. And so just always think, you know, sort of surgical wounds as well, you know, patient with severe pain, you've got to listen to the patient. It's very easy to dismiss some patients, particularly younger patients are sometimes dismissed. Um, and it's always important to bear these rarer complications, compartment syndrome, necrotizing fasciitis in mind. If you've got a patient that the external signs aren't obvious, but they've got severe pain, start thinking about these things. The other risk factors similar to cellulitis, so diabetic, immunocompromised patients, and in children, a recent um, chickenpox infection is a risk factor. Um, so it's extremely rare, but it's, it's just something to bear in mind and something that sometimes comes up in exam questions as well. So in terms of investigation and management, I've highlighted surgical debridement. Antibiotics, you, they, they, they might buy you a little bit of time. You should get them in while you're organizing theater, but these patients need to go to theater as quickly as possible to remove this dead and dying tissue. It needs to be cut back until it's bleeding. Um, so what you'll see if you go to theatre with these patients and you cut, you cut into this tissue, you get this awful dishwater-like uh, discharge that's coming from it. The, the tissue doesn't actually bleed. Um, it's got this awful, you know, sort of cloudy, murky discharge as you're cutting into this flesh. You have to get back to the point that it bleeds. And often the level of infection is not obvious from the outside. As I said, the skin changes, the external changes can occur later. The infection may have spread up the limb, you know, some considerable distance beyond the, the externally visible signs. And so although there might be a small patch on the leg of this dusky skin, sometimes these patients end up having you know, quite extensive amputations, much higher um, than the, the external appearances, because it's the deeper tissue that's been damaged and that needs to be cut away. And this it's often, you know, it, it's difficult, it's difficult surgery. Um, you know, you're often losing a lot of tissue and it can be very difficult to salvage the limb, uh, depending on the extent of the infection. These patients end up on intensive care. They often need inotropic support, you know, prolonged admissions, and they often have to go back to theatre repeatedly to try and excise um, this damaged infected tissue. In terms of the antibiotics, it's likely to include clindamycin. Um, these patients often end up getting uh, you know, quite a cocktail, um, but usually clindamycin ends up in there. And in terms of investigations, there are things that can help you come to the diagnosis. So there are some scoring systems uh, based on the blood results. Um, but for these patients, you, you want to look at you know, the CRP, the, CRP, the CK, the U's and E's. They may, they may develop a, an acute kidney injury quite rapidly because of the extent of the, of the sepsis that they have. Um, Coagulation screens, again, the severity of the illness can affect the clotting. 
we can end up with DIC. Think about uh, cross-matching the patient for theatre as well. As I said, this can be extremely extensive surgery. And so if you're seeing this patient early on, you know, get the, get the cross-match sent off. This all helps the patient you know, with getting to theatre, getting the correct treatment that they need. So just added on to this diagram here, we're going right down to the deeper level. So with, you know, past that subcutaneous tissue, the fascial planes and into the muscle. That's where this infection is and where it's starting. And as, you know, it explains why you may not see the superficial effects, uh, you know, any erythema until later on. Um, you know, by the time you're getting those, those skin changes, this dusky skin, the blistering, um, you, all the skin looks pale and it, it's, um, the capillary refill is affected. The patient may be in a state of profound shock by then. So I think my, my real takeaway for you know, from this talk is when you're clinically looking at patients, the most severe looking infections superficially may be the least worrying in terms of the patient's outcome. That you may get a patient who's got the uh, bullus impetigo, which the rash can look awful, but think about the underlying pathology, the skin layers, think about why it looks that way. And it might give you some clues as to what's going on. And I hope that this talk has demonstrated why some of the most severe infections may not have clinical skin changes that are obvious, um, but it's really important that you make the diagnosis um, and get the patient you know, the right treatment for what may be the most severe form of, of skin infection that you can have. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions.